Good morning. Welcome to The Brew. Today, we are going to talk about Palantir Technologies, ticker symbol PLTR. It's had quite the move lately. So let's take a look at this. It's a, a big data company, specializes in data, anal data analytics for government agencies and the like. Molly's going to break it down. We're going to look at some trades to do um, and see where we can go. On the opening bell, bam. Good morning, Mom. Good morning. I feel like we need to do like a morning dance, get that music rolling past the credits. I know. Happening this week. We're, it's happening this week. That's good to hear. <laughs> I know. So we can, we can bleed and fade right into it. How are you? Good. I think we should harvest the details on uh, Palantir here. Um, I've got my coffee. Don't worry about a thing. Um, yeah. So uh, Tonight, heard, this is, a, this is yeah. a juicy company. This is really juicy. It's going to be a good CT episode. So um, I don't know much about this company. However, I pulled it up and we're going to look at it on um, on Tradehawk in a little bit. Um, give us the breakdown. What's going on with this thing? What did, what did you learn through the research? Tell us a little bit about this stock. And the ticker symbol is P, P as in Paul, L, Lima, T, right? Uh, oh, R. yeah. Yeah. As in Romeo. Okay. All right. So Alex Karp is the CEO. He's got this wild, curly, mad scientist hair. He's got, he has um, a little bit of law background, business philosophy even, which is, you know, always nice to hear when someone's forefronting AI to have that component. Um, mm -hmm. So there was, they were the hot topic and then they took a dive. There was apologies all over the internet of, so we're just going to, we're going to be cautiously optimistic as we go. We are expecting a course correction because it has just, its value has skyrocketed. So, but we're going to look at the underlying value of the stock to show that it's one of those, um, you know, if you want to just inch along, just gently, um, you know, if you, if you just want to kind of parse out a little, if you, if you're pro AI, so Mm -hmm. Let's get into it. 20% growth year over year. 70% of that mm -hmm. is U.S. commercial growth. So they got they they have the beginning government contracts. So what what do they do? They are uh, they've big data. So they there's this great book by Trevanian called Shibumi, and mm -hmm. it's a classic. I want to say it was written in the 60s, but I could be wrong on that. But it was written a while ago, and there was a computer in, you know, I think it was MI6, MI5 mm -hmm. called um, uh, Fat Boy. And mm -hmm. basically Palantir is the Fat Boy and it just consumes all data around it. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, Alex Karp was interviewed saying that this is the main difference between um, their, their AI and mm -hmm. other AI. So he's prepared he's proposing that the other AIs, so ChatGPT and those in that, in that group, they all operate kind of the same. Their, their infrastructure is built somewhat the same. And so mm -hmm. he's saying that his AI is, com is differential and okay. that without, and he doesn't ever get into details. It's probably complicated. So we, that'll be another show. We're going to dive into the differences, but, um, what they do as far as their uh, sales funnel is something called AIP boot camps, and AIP stands for Artificial Intelligence Platforms, and they just go and they just demo it. So they believe and stand behind their product. They take all of their engineers, they take the product, mm -hmm. probably not all the engineers, but some of them, and they've run these boot camps. Um, and so, company per, per, uh, future customers will start building next to their engineers any kind of component that will bulk up their companies so uh alex carp was saying that you know you can't get away anymore with having just kind of a flat ai you really mm -hmm. have to have software in general that 10x is your company and it can it it's across every kind of um problem so it's, it solves everything so if you have an engineering problem and you have uh uh, parts 
in a car that keep breaking, it analyzes the data of where that breakage occurs. If you have, um, you know, we, we are going to speak on Friday about uh, the, what energy source is AI going to use? And mm -hmm. so Paul is going to propose that nuclear is going to be one of those. So AI also, and that big data can go in and make sure that um, nuclear becomes safer. So there is no end to what they can solve and how much they can bulk up your business. So to look at the the core of it, 20% um, I mentioned growth year over year, 70% is US commercial growth. Okay, so I just wanted to repeat that because that is in the last year or two, they prior to that, they were really government contract focused. And now they have with this huge um, this explosion of AI, they've now gone into the commercial sector and their AI boot camps have increased 500%. So that's their sales funnel. And that means that they went from, they're like, for instance, here's an example. Their goal this year was to do 500 boot camps. Okay. It's not even April and they've done 560. Boot camps. So, yeah, boot camp. So that means a presentation to their proposed oh. customers, just saying we can, we instead of taking faith that our faith that our product is better, go use it. So they um, their forty four percent customer growth year over year. That's from two sixty to three seventy five. Mm -hmm. So that that's a huge bulk. Then top thirty seven deals mm -hmm. pay five million or more a year. The top 21 deals pay 10 million more a year mm -hmm. and top 20 clients are paying, we're paying 49 million a year, 40, 49 million a year ago. And now that's bumped up in just one year to 55 million. So there's like, they have 84% gross margin, 50% free cash flow margin, customer billings increased by 56%. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So this so, is a good story. I mean, this is a good story. And then please, I always say, you know, AI, just invest with your eyes wide open with, you know, make sure that where the money goes and who yeah. you're supporting, really do your deep research. Do not trust us. Gather your own opinions and make sure that your investments are going to the right place. Yeah. So if, you know, with that dip and being cautiously optimistic and, you know, with an anticipation that there is going to be a course correction what kind of strategy would you would you place on this um so I, I looked at this so i'm i'm looking at the the financials now i just like to see what kind of company this is so you gave us a good rundown there um incidentally the 52 week high and low what do you think they are yeah. so right now it's trading let's give it 24 and a half ish thereabouts um the 52 week high is 27 and a half just a little off from where we are a few dollars what do you think the low is over 52 weeks any idea Guess ballpark. No, go go for it. You tell us. Seven dollars and twenty eight cents. Oh yeah, I did know that. So yeah, that's right. quite the the monster move. It's got a market cap of fifty three, almost fifty four billion dollars. Right. That's monster. Um, net income about ninety three, ninety four million, ninety three million. Let's call it. Um, on revenue of six hundred eight. Uh, yeah. Million dollars. Pretty good. Um. So anyway, I don't. Guess what the, the bad news is about that? I don't care about any of those numbers, really. And why? Well, because I'm an everyone. options trader. Options traders don't care about this stuff. <laughs> right? I, mean, I don't. And why don't options traders care? This is really we big. have so much flexibility with options. We can <laughs> we don't have to pick a direction necessarily, but if you have a directional bias, okay. Um, in this case, are we, we're going to go long here, right? We feel it's going to continue its upward move. So let's take a look at. At the, at the board. And, Let's go to Trade Hawk and, and have a look. Go ahead. And before you, while you're bringing up Trade Hawk, let's, um, you know, we're, there's talk that they're going to join the One Trillion Club. And if anyone's seen Silicon Valley, the TV show, that's Cuatro Comas. That's so cuatro, cuatro, comas. cuatro Comas Club. Wait, that's, so, that's more comas than I have. Right. So Wait, revenue. One account? <laughs> <laughs> so projected revenue for 2024 is 2.71 billion projected for 2025 is 3.23 billion so for them to get into that club they have to have revenue growth to 60 billion yeah so that's a yeah. huge jump but it you know i i just foresee that they've been in the game probably longer than most people and they've yep. you know with government contracts there's always Boy, the government contracts are probably the black ops projects that you don't hear, and they've been playing with those. So right. they've 
they're playing with better opponents, it, not better opponents, but just more advanced opponents so that they've yep. had to, you know, be, be more robust. Sure. Okay. So we All see right. trade hog. What, what would you do? What's your play? What's well, your big here's, move? Here's a couple things first. Um, First of all, we're not giving an investment advice. We want to be clear about that. This is just yes. an exercise in, in how I would look at something if I were bullish, okay? And I'm not saying I'm bullish on this stock necessarily. I don't know it. So um, I'm just looking at some numbers. But you can see the, the 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 chart here. This is over the last 500 days. I put 500 in here, roughly 500. Um, and you can see the low end down here. That was at $7, you know, numbers thereabouts. And here we are up, up to the right here of 27, 25 and change. Um is where it hit. So it's had quite the move. Great. Wonderful. What I like to do is I want to know where implied volatility is. Okay. Because I have to do an options trade. I don't want to sell cheap volatility. I don't want to buy expensive volatility. I want to do the opposite. Okay. That's number one. So we're going to take a look at how I look at that. Number two, um, we have to decide what kind of trade we're going to do. Is it going to be risk defined or is it gonna be open-ended? Okay, we'll talk about that in a second, all right? All right, first, let's look at implied volatility. A couple of ways to do that on TradeHawk. There's an implied volatility template. I'm gonna turn it on. It's gonna get messy for a second. Let me fix a few things up. I am going to take away the underlying price action, and you're gonna have these really colorful lines. The pink line, or whatever the color that is, fuchsia, I guess, um, is the intraday implied volatility, I'm sorry, intraday realized volatility of the underlying stock. So that's how much the stock moves intraday, okay? So you can see it kind of bumping around. The blue, that little, I don't know, sky blue kind of color is the implied volatility of a rolling 30-day option, okay? So that, if you look at it, they're very close to one another. So implied and actual are very close to one another. So not much edge there at all. But you can see that this blue line is on the, if you can see where my crosshair is, the blue is on the very lower end of where 30 day is. If you look far out back in time, we've had highs up here in the almost 90 area, 93 implied volatility. And we have this low down here where we currently are of 44 implied volatility. So we're at the very, very low end of 30-day implied volatility. It is cheap. Yeah. Okay. So this is a study I look at a lot. Now I'm going to turn this stuff back on. I'm going to get rid of this so we get all the um, all the lines off of here. Okay. Remember what we saw? Implied volatility is low. Another way to look at this is to go into the volatility workshop component. Okay. And have a look at implied volatility here. So what this shows me is the same 30-day. Very low implied volatility. You can see the meter down here pointing down toward the zero line, meaning it's very, very low. Same with IV rank, really, really low. Okay. So implied volatility is low. Kind of good if we're expecting movement. We can buy cheap stuff, get a good move, take advantage, right? Yeah. So far, so good. So far, so good. Okay. And ask a you know, question if, if you want, Mal. Yes. So talk about uh, grams dollar cost averaging. So if you're if you like the stock, but you don't know when to get in because mm -hmm. it's dipped and now it's up and now, you know, even though volatility is very quite low. But what how explain that just for beginners? What is that? So, well, that all the, the dollar cost average is, you, you know, you, you you're you have a, a composite number of shares that you want to buy, whatever it is, 100, 500, 1000 doesn't matter. And you're going to take in and you're going to pace yourself into the full position. So you're going to buy 100 shares. And it doesn't have to be 100. It can be 50. It can be anything. But you're going to buy. And if it you know continues um, to, to trend lower, you're going to buy a little more. And then if it trends lower, you're going to buy a little more. And and, and it's not because you necessarily, you're necessarily you getting killed and it's going to just tank. You just take an advantage of um, of lower price movement to enhance your your, your cost basis. So you buy a little bit at each point. Now, the risk there is that if you get in and it screams from where your first little bite is, your little nibble, um, you don't get the full value. You, you miss it, right? right? So personally, I'm not a fan. But um, what I like to do is look at the options. So as okay. I said, these options are cheap. Now, what you're looking at is an option chain. Okay, all it is is a list of, of all the strikes, right? Strikes are right down the middle. They're labeled here. I don't know if you can see it in the screen but they're labeled here. So what I did was I went out and chose 37 days. Now here's what's critical for the investor, okay? When you're choosing your time horizon, I don't have an answer for you what the magic number is. 
because I don't know how long you believe that the stock is going to take to, to, to giddy up and go. Okay. Now mm -hmm. I personally like a little bit shorter dated stuff because I'm not so much an investor as I am more of a trader. There is no right or wrong answer. You can be either one. Um, I like to look in the 30 to 60 day range, depending on, you know, how I feel about the, the likelihood of the stock making its move. Okay. So okay. what I've done here is I've chosen 37 days close enough. Gives me a little time vols cheap. So it's not going to cost me a lot to get in. And we'll take a look at what, what I mean by that. So what I like to do is when I decide on my time frame, my expiration, in this case, I've chosen May um, of May of this year. Uh, the third of May is the expiration. So it's about a month away or so, 37 and just days. Review, and just review the yep. strategy you're going after as you enter. Well, we're going to talk about that in a sec. Um, there's okay. some good data here too, to look at it. So okay. here's what I'm looking at. We've decided we're bullish. Okay. okay? Yes. So we think this is going to continue Ca higher. Cautious, cautiously bullish. Cautiously okay. bullish. So the <laughs> key word there is cautiously. If it's cautious, then you can do a call spread or a put spread depending on the case. Now, if volatility were high, implied volatility were high, I'd look to sell a put spread, okay? Because I'm okay. taking advantage of high volatility. Selling stuff means you're get, you're collecting premium because it's high and it's a good thing to do. What okay. I've noticed here is that I chose, and I'm gonna tell you why I chose the 28.29. The stock is trading 24 and a half. I chose the 28 call and the 29 call. I'm going to do a bull call spread. That okay. means that it benefits when the stock goes higher. Okay? okay. Now I randomly chose a dollar wide. You can choose $2. You can choose 50 cents. You can choose whatever's up there. It's up to you how much you want to expend. One of the little tricks I like to use is, do you see the width of this, of the strikes? 28 and 29 is $1 wide. Correct? It's tight. That's tight. Tight. It can be $2. You can make it whatever you want. But let's just look at it for an example. It's $1 wide. What I like to use as a rule of thumb, when I when when implied volatility is cheap, it's generally that spread, that one by one spread, buying the 28, selling the 29, okay? If it's less than 40% of the strike difference, so the strike is $1 times 40% equals 40 cents, okay? So yeah. if that spread is trading less than 40 cents, I would consider it fairly cheap. Now, if it's 38 cents, it's right around the cusp. But if it's 35 cents, it's still right around the cusp, right? But when it gets, starts getting way cheaper than 40 cents, okay, it's pretty cheap. It's an indication to you that implied volatility is probably pretty cheap. Make okay. sense? It's a good yes. little rule of thumb. You don't see okay. that written anywhere, but it's our little trader uh, speak of what we like to look at. Now, right. look at the price of this spread. I, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen, but I'm circling it up here. Yes. It's roughly trading 30 cents, which is under 40, right? When I opened this up, it was around 20 cents. So I don't know what happened here, but, uh, you know, things are moving. Um, so it's pretty cheap. You know, it's 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 a, it's not too hot, not too cold. It's somewhere, in, you know, on the cheaper side of, of, of normal. Um, so, I you know, I probably end up purchasing this spread if, if, if I got into it as opposed to selling the put spread. But what happens here is that this spread will benefit as the stock goes up. I'm long the lesser strike. I'm short the greater strike. And notice it's in a one-to-one -one ratio. There's no ratios here at all. I'm looking for a small gain on this one. I can only make a dollar less what I paid for it. If I pay 30 cents to make the math easy, I can make the dollar minus 30 cents or 70 cents in this example. Okay. And, That's it. And again, yeah. And again, if you're sitting on this, so let's say you want to keep Palantir and you like it. Let's say you, you know, and, and again, this is a credit spread, so you don't have to. No, it's a debit spread. There's a debit spread. Sorry, spread. I meant debit yep. spread. By the way, we have a great show with Tom Nunemaker coming up and he's going to talk about asymmetrical condors. And I was wondering oh. if the, um, if a credit put spread is basically just an iron condor going topless. That's a good way to say it. I like it. Yes, it is going top. Can I say that? Did you make that up? That's actually really clever. Mom. I know. I still laugh at it. So anyway, so here, so this is kind of a good play with it, that if you want to hold the stock and you you're yep. optimistically you're optimistic on the stock, you expect these to um, expire worthless, so that you're basically you want to keep the stock and you're just crumb collecting as you go. Correct. Well, no, I don't know what you're talking about now. Now you confuse okay. me. We're talking about this call spread, and then you went into like a covered call or something. Oh, sorry, I was no, I was talking about the put spread. Oh, that you're well, let me finish the call spread. Yeah. I know, I know. Jeez. Okay, okay. 
Um, <laughs> all right, so let's take a look at this. Let me let me just go over a couple of things here. Okay. Here's some interesting facts on this one. Okay, and this is going to get a little bit headier, but we're going to take it slow. So, do you see the open interest on the 27 line? I'm again, my mouse. I hope you can see my mouse on the screen. 13,249 contracts are open in the 27 line. Okay. That's yeah. always a good indication, but look at all the other openings, really small in the hundreds, in the hundreds, in the hundreds, not a lot of volume in the stock in the hundreds and, hundreds, and then 13,200. All of a sudden, I'm curious what's going on here. Why that number? Okay. And this can help you place your trades. Here's in your trade plan. Number two step. If you're looking for movement, take a look at the, at the money straddle in the month in question. We're in May third, 37 days in trade hawk. It's this nice orange line. That's the, at the money. What I like to do is take the midpoint of the markets. Let's say they're, you know, it's 177 at 183 on the call. On the put side, it is what? 175 at 180. So let's call it 180 on both sides. If you add 180 twice, call and put, 360 is the math. It's the resulting number. Okay. That's about the expected move of this stock based on implied volatility going forward. So it can either, don't forget, it doesn't tell you direction. It tells you how much it's going to move based on the market making community and this implied volatility. So 360, let's call it $4. Doesn't have to be exact. We're dropping grenades here. We're not doing brain science or brain surgery. So $4 is easier math. So 28 and a half to the upside, right? Roughly. And then $4 down, 20 and a half to the downside. So since we're having an upward bias on this particular trade, I like to place it right around that number. So I'm going to move it down a little bit, the spread. I said 28 and a half. So that gets my short right to the to the top end of the expected move. Is this making any sense, Ma? Yeah, absolutely. I, okay. I, I, I'm excited to get to the put spread because I I, I okay. want to hold the click crumbs. All right. But I love, this is great. No, this is a really great explanation. And so um, if, yeah. It, Go yeah, ahead. just want to remind everyone you can pause. This is to study, so you don't have to capture this all in this. You can yeah, this will be. This is recorded too. It's going. Yeah. it'll be in on YouTube and in the, in the hub. Um, okay, so we expect the move to be around twenty eight and a half. That's where my short is. Now, if it's way higher than that, wonderful. We want anyway. So we get to the upper end of our range. We get to our our full dollar less what we pay for it. That's wonderful. Here's another thing that's really important here, which most people don't understand. This thirteen thousand two hundred forty nine is a big open interest. Something's going on there. So what I like to do, and you can do this in Tradehawk, is I like to go to the volatility container where we looked at that open interest. I'm sorry, that, that implied volatility. And there's something called dealer exposure. I'm going to click on it and I've chosen that month. So look at this big like wrinkle down in gamma on the 27 line. So this is what the dealers hold. Okay. So importantly, the dealers on that 13,249 contracts, they're short gamma there, okay? Mm -hmm. They're short those options. So the investing public or institutions has bought that options. Someone else believes that this is going higher. When dealers are short gamma, they get shorter as the stock goes up and longer as the stock goes down, opposite mm -hmm. of what you would intend. Dealers like to be delta neutral. So they, as they get shorter, they will buy more stock or more deltas to keep themselves flat. So if dealers are buying stock as it's going toward this 27 line, they may have a tendency to push it through that 27 point because they're short that gamma up until the point they get fully hedged. So that's good news for us if we get through that 27 strike. Now we have an added push from our market maker friends who have to be de delta neutral and potentially push this thing up and beyond that 27 line and put maybe pushing us into the free zone up here. Okay. Just, just a question. This is probably not a good question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. No stupid questions. So um, if there is a run on this stock, what's the time adjustment that it takes a market maker to then jump in and start pushing those stock prices up along hey, with the community? Look at in the, in the okay. old days when I was doing this and we were doing this more or less by, you know, a hand, but that's in quotes. Um, it would be instantaneous. We do it all day long for the most part. Oh, In today's world with computerized market making companies, and there's only about, I don't know, 10 to 15 of them left, if that, um, it's pretty much dispersed, meaning these firms have such big portfolios. They probably aren't hedging every trade anymore. They're probably not 
you know, um, uh, dynamically hedging minute by minute like we used to um, because they can lay things off against one another. So it's not as profound probably as it used to be, but this is a good stick in the mud right here. This is a this is an attraction zone, right? And if it gets through there, it could really push it. So that's why I like this spread. Now, look, it, you don't make a lot of money, 70 cents versus 30, okay? But you can move this along. You can take the short, move it up to the 30 line if you want, right? You can do all kinds of things. If I had the 27 and a half, 30. Now I've got two and a half dollars of potential juice. Let's see what that spread costs. I closed my thing here. So that's 43 cents. See what I mean? It's a matter of yeah. how much you, you can afford to spend. Because if you're wrong, yeah. you're going to lose what you pay for this. That's it. End right. of story. Now, I don't want to get too deep here because we're going long. Um, if you have an unlimited view of the upside, you can reverse all this and do a ratio spread where you buy more calls than you're selling. Ooh. And okay. then what you have is you have unlimited upside for wow. maybe a small price to the downside. And we're going to talk about that on, on the next episode of this because it's too, too long to get into. But I want people to understand it as well. And it's a great type of position with low volatility to be buying more options than you're short. Because when you're buying stuff, you're paying for it, right? Yeah. Now, you might be able to do these things for credits. We'll have to look at it in the, in, in the next episode. Um, but it's a good strategy to have if you're really, really bullish or really, really bearish, depending on which side you, you decide to do. Um, and you can get unlimited exposure with limited risk, which is really cool. And you mentioned how much are you willing to spend? So let's say if a new retail trader is just jumping in, they have a smaller portfolio and they're trying to get those returns. So if you're just doing an, you know, anything naked, they're going to, the cap requirement is probably going to be thir a third, where if you do these credit spreads, it's much smaller. So even though your these credit spreads will actually increase um, your rate of return. Is that correct? Even with less capital out because of the less the smaller capital. Well, the, well, yeah. If I can do ratios, it'll increase my my potential return. If we do, we're, and we're not going to get to your put spread either. But if we did the put spread too, uh, sorry, you got to remember for next time. Um, okay. we're, so we're gonna, we'd probably be selling. We, we'll be selling that put spread again. It's probably not expensive okay. enough to sell. The reason I chose this particular one, though, in this case, is because I saw that 13,000 open interest. I then went and checked what side the dealers are on. Yeah. Great result. Then I want to place my, my, my short right around expected move, right? This is just a recap. You decide how wide you want that spread to be based on what you can afford to spend, right? My rule of thumb for new retail traders is try not to risk more than two-ish percent of your equity on any one trade. So- you know, if you that was have, good. Repeat that. That was really good. Repeat that if you could. I like to have risk profile of about two percent of my equity on any individual trade or strategy. Okay. So if I if I lose two percent, that's in the zone. I don't want to lose ten percent. I don't lose twenty percent of my equity on any one trade. I like to be right around two percent. Okay. Because okay. I have a bunch of trades, I can have a bunch of trades there and be around two percent. Now, hopefully, you're not losing all the trades all the time, but um, right. it's a nice rule of thumb. So we have a few rules of thumb. Uh, call and put spreads, 40% rule, 40% of the strike. If it's higher than that, implied volatility is probably a little high. If it's lower than that, implied volatility is probably a little low. We want to buy low volatility. We want to sell high volatility. Yeah. Expected move, a uh, little trick number two, add the midpoint of the, of the call and put at the money. That's straddle. Add those two numbers together, those two markets together, up or down that amount. That's about where you can place your short. Because that's what the market making community is expecting that stock to move. It's not the exact number. It's very close. And it's close enough for government work in, in our case. Okay. And then beyond that, you've got to decide what 2% means to you and how much you're going to expend. How wide are you going to set those strikes, right? Based on what you can afford. And how far out in time? Obviously, the longer you go in time, the more time you have for this thing to behave and, and do its thing. You probably might have to pay a little bit more out there. But that's a that's a trade-off you have to you have to decide on. Okay. All right. So that's a lot to unpack. I encourage folks, I know we're doing this uh, on a live basis. Um, I know it's hard to, to stay with this, and I'm not writing things in on the remarkable today. Um, but go back, re-watch this, try to understand it, send us questions. Um, for God's sakes, I'm Lex at tradier.com. I know I shouldn't say that, <laughs> send me an email. 1 800 one eight hundred uh trading hotties. Just there there you go. There you go. Um, but yeah, I want, I'd love to have some feedback. And if you have questions about the strategy, let us know. I can, I can really pa unpack it um, in future episodes. Right. Yeah. And, and if someone, yeah, if someone's just starting to learn and they're taking steps of learning new strategies just to take the, 
mysticism out as we go into the next episode with Tom in a couple in in a few. Um, that an iron condor is what? It's just that credit spread on the other side. It's just so yeah. Spread. So in my case, mm -hmm. I did the long put long call spread. They typically do short iron condors in the retail world. They're selling a put spread, selling a call spread, right? They're doing both because they believe yeah. that the underlying stock asset is going to stay within that range. And they're going to collect that shortness of the premium on the put spread, premium on the call spread. They get to collect both, put it in the bank, move on to the next one. So we'll, we'll and unpack that in the in, in yeah. time. So. And the really interesting is the stock can't go two ways at the same time. So the, the, the cap requirement is only the greater of the two. So really, if your returns look really good with those. Yeah. I think he's going to do some funkiness, Tom, is on, on, on these things. Be asymmetric. Be flying asymmetrical condors. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. So, Ma, we up making your notes. We have to talk about the um, the ratio back spread in low volatility for oh, yeah. unlimited movement. We have to yeah. talk about your put spread relative to this and see the opposite side. Um, and we ran out of time on today's show, but this is a good start. Um, remember what we did though. We looked at open interest too. Really important. If there's nothing there, you know, doesn't have the added benefit of a little double bounce on a trampoline to push that up through there, but it's okay. Right. Um, we still have a belief that we're going higher and that's our own opinion. Not, you know, not investment advice. No investment Wait. advice blah, here. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> say that. Okay, cool. Thanks, right, Lex. Uh, as always, thanks for taking the time to to show everyone the, yep. what, the what happens behind the Oz curtain of the market makers and these incredible strategies and trade hawk presentation. So really, it's really great. Yep. Thank um, you. Thank you. Good to see you. And on that note, I'm going to have the rest of my iced coffee. And I will <laughs> see you on the next show, Mal. All right, Lex. That's a wrap. Bye, Bye. now. All opinions expressed by Tradier Hub contributors are solely the contributors' opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Tradier nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Hub contributors as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or to follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of their opinion. The contributors' opinions are based on their own personal research, but neither Tradier nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warrants its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. Any trades or positions discussed or referred to by contributors may or may not be accurate Actual live trades or positions. Such information is not intended to be a financial or investment advice. Trade Your Inc. is the parent company of Trade Your Brokerage Inc. Trade Your Brokerage Inc. and Trade Your Inc. are separate entities with their own products and services. Securities products and services are offered through Trade Your Brokerage Inc. Trade Your Brokerage Inc. is an independent subsidiary of Trade Your Inc. All rights reserved. Member FINRA SIPC.